I think I'm on, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm not a professional speaker, so I brought some notes. <laughs> I'm George Dobbs. I'm uh, an architect with Mass Mutual. Over the last year, I've been kind of obsessed about how to recognize customers uh, remotely, uh, customers and other people. Um, so we have an identity program, a trusted identity program. It's already been a journey. It's been about a year. So I thought I'd start with some highlights of a famous journey. Now, admittedly, the Trojan War was not a customer interaction, but today's customer interfaces are under attack. Um, so a few related themes from the Odyssey, just to get us started. Uh, the imposter is pretending to be a customer and is escaping from, and now, cyber ops. Uh, customers who've been away a long time, we still want to recognize them. We don't want to send them, you know, we don't want to beat them away with a chair. And of course, biometrics today don't really involve looking at a scar from a boar's tusk. So that's my little hero. Um, the, uh, that's supposed to represent the people in our financial companies that are trying to defend. Um, I'm going to spend a little time on how we got here um, and what, um, what the modern problem is and what we can do about it. We've really, as a civilization, we kind of come to rely on our ability to recognize people remotely, um, or to interact, rather. I, I don't think we actually um, recognize them particularly well. So we deal with paper, we deal with phone, web, mobile, but as we'll see, sometimes safety has been shortcut a little bit here. We want to stay in business. We're going to have to be able to pick out the fraudsters uh, efficiently and accurately. Let's take a look back. Uh, I'm in the life insurance business for most of my career. Um, not everybody understands the life insurance business, so just a couple of points. It's a two-sided business model. The, the, uh, it accumulates capital that can be applied to long-term long obligations. That's a very useful thing for civilization. And it also supports families by protecting them in the case of a, a death. Um, the, many of our products also accumulate cash value. So these cash values are actually targets for the fraudsters. Overall, life insurance is, is a positive force for civilization and it's worth keeping. So a little bit about Mass Mutual, the company I'm working with, for. Um, it's been around for quite a while. The oldest part uh, is actually bearings. Uh, interesting fact, it helped uh, fund the Louisiana Purchase. And um, The, um, the company has some international subsidiaries, but I'm focusing on the U.S., so this is a very U.S.-centered talk. A uh, couple, about those policy loans, there's, uh, if you, if you want to Google something called, Google this, uh, Live Mutual Great Depression, there's a great story in there about the banking holiday. It's three weeks in Detroit in the winter about how uh, it turned out Mass Mutual came through and helped some people keep their houses warm. Uh, it's a fun story. Another point is uh, Mass Mutual is also in the retirement business, so these uh, these accounts are also targets for the fraudsters. So, in the 1950s, Mass Mutual hired 
Norman Rockwell to do some advertisement, so this is a Norman Rockwell uh, picture. I like it because it shows the personal relationship between the agent, the sales agent, and the insured. Uh, we still have sales agents, but uh, a lot of our transactions have become remote. So fraud has always been an issue with life insurance. Uh, anywhere there's a pile of money, you can expect there to be criminals trying to get a hold of it. Uh, the general approach in the past has been to uh, set up a, a unit in the company called a special investigations unit. And it's detective control, it's a, it's a forensic approach to it, and it's usually involved with recovery uh, as opposed to prevention. Uh, today, the most pressing accounts are the account takeover type, uh, the most of the pressing attacks are the account take takeover attacks. Uh, there's, with the internet and the call centers, these are attacks that can be undertaken kind of with an industrial approach. So the bad guys are getting quite smart about it. Dealing with these is basically going to be table stakes for life insurance companies. The, um, there are some longer games at play too. Uh, for instance, money laundering, unfortunately, appears to be a growth industry. So we heard from our advisors that uh, there's lots of, uh, in our industry, all the life insurance companies are under attack. Um, and the warning says that these uh, are on the account takeover side. The detective controls that we had in the past are really no match for these, just due to the scale. And the other thing is the context has changed the, with um, the banks have, have um, were an obvious target for fraud. Uh, but the banks have really gotten much better at protecting against it. So the fraudsters are now looking for softer targets. Unfortunately, that's the life insurance uh, companies and maybe some others. So let's look back at how we got here. So back in the paper era, uh, fraud was a thing. You know, Congress, uh, had to write a law, 1872, mail fraud. One other thing that's interesting is before the age of, of Xerox and, and desktop printing, the forms themselves were actually an authentication factor. You, people didn't have the forms unless they had a, a real transaction. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. The, uh, the telephone, you know, we think of it as always been there, but it wasn't always there. Uh, by the mid-50s, we basically had coast-to-coast -coast direct dial starting to be a real thing. By uh, 52, Congress decided they had to update the fraud laws to include wire fraud. And the, another more modern thing is the voice over IP has created a new way to spoof the, the caller ID. So you, that's um, adding to the trouble. Call centers haven't been here forever, but um, they're, they're pretty, they came into play in the 80s and they all use uh, private data, so what we already know about you when you call, and then also credit header data, public knowledge questions. Uh, in 2017, that's pretty much the end of the line for that approach. Uh, the bad guys can answer all those questions better than the good guys. So most people are familiar with the history of the internet, but take a look at the, the sheer volume of uh, undersea cable traffic and together with you know, other techniques like uh, attacks on websites and, and voice over IP, it's kind of an open door. There's just a lot of capacity there. A series of banking innovations 
extended the scale and geography of banks. Um, they pretty much, uh, well, we, we kind of know how the banks have, have grown over this time. But take a look at 1995. The banks already realized that they needed to start investing in protection. So, and that's why now uh, they're in a pretty good place or better place and life insurance is a good substitute target. Bottom line is that every convenience and efficiency has generated a new opportunity for fraud. So given the warnings, some things need to change. You know, sorry, the customer is not always right. You know, sometimes it's the bad guy. So we've created a dedicated team starting the move from detection to prevention. I mean, there will always be detection, but uh, so that's going to be a, a bit of a journey. <laughs> so the things that we were immediately available to us, I mean, if you take a look, uh, I think you'll, you'll agree that there's uh, quite a bit of room for further investment, uh, not particularly strong. So one thing that uh, we were able to do and other companies have been able to do is uh, invest in some tools in the call center. Uh, I call it listening closely, machine assisted style. So it kind of helps us, we don't have to listen to every single call. We only have to listen to a subset of calls to look for fraudulent activity. And we're finding some. Uh, this, is, this is good at, uh, you know, the call center reps have kind of been put in the position of trying to be fraud detectors. but. That's not their training, they're not, I mean, some of them are pretty good at it, but it's better to take this sort of approach. Let's take a look at what some of the adversaries are doing. So, the, the, if you listen to the fraud calls that we were able to detect, you can hear, you may be able to hear uh, their operation in the background. So there's background noise in these calls, and. You know, this was a story told by the vendor, but they were actually hearing, you know, two guys in each other's calls. And so, so the bottom line is they're running dedicated outbound call centers. The bad guys. This is what we're up against. And then you think about how they're targeting. You don't even have to go to the dark web. There's public data available. You can pick or figure out where, where people's 401 accounts, 401k accounts are. Some of these accounts have hundreds of thousands of dollars in them, millions even. That's not a good setup. So we need to protect, protect that. So after the, uh, the famous breach there, before it was announced, then you get that uptick. So that's, that's uh, no coincidence, so. All right, so we're going to need a plan. What are we going to do? The trends are going in the wrong direction. Uh, my company and I think others have decided that we're going to have to make some investments. You know, we're going to have to do architecture, projects, techniques, all that stuff, and, and try to make the situation better. So. I guess I didn't get that right. Okay, so here's the attack surface. You got, you got paper, you know, the, the old original one. So it's very difficult to authenticate paper coming in. Um, we're actually hoping we can strengthen the, the call center and the digital side so that we can kind of soft pedal paper, maybe get rid of it at some point. The, um, you know, multiple call centers, the voice response units. So one of the, one of the things the bad guys are doing is uh, uh, just sort of going into the IVRs and trying all sorts of combinations. So you gotta have controls around that. And then 
In our case, we have uh, social engineering attacks coming against the agents, so the agents can transact for customers. And in life insurance business, it, maybe it's been a while since the agent talked to somebody. Well, yeah, this is Joe. Yeah, you remember me. Well, not, you know, could you do this loan for me? Well, sometimes they do. So <laughs> that's not a great setup. So we need authentication there. Um, all right, moving on. So uh, sometimes these guys don't call for a long time, many, many years. Sometimes when they do call, it's not really them. So that's a problem. Um, biometrics, uh, I think people are thinking some, some kind of pixie dust or something with biometrics, but uh, we gotta be careful. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not really there yet, and the norms and expectations aren't really solid. Um, all right, so there's, there's really no 100% solutions. You know, the public knowledge questions, we know those are weak. In our case, uh, private knowledge, the, our transaction rate is too low for that to be particularly useful. Um, postal system, it's pretty easy to get somebody's address changed without even, you know, being authorized. Um, email ownership, well, we know email's not particularly strong. Um, the telco system can be faked out as we've been hearing quite a bit about SMS folks, but also, you know, spoofing on caller ID, or in the case of 800 numbers called ANI. Devices, well, yeah, that's probably the future, but right now it's, uh, it's not 100%. And for our, cu our customers, not everybody has a mobile. And behavior anomalies are great, but it just creates a bunch of things that ha somebody has to look at. So the only reasonable thing to do is to try to patch these various approaches together in a, um, uh, well, hopefully the Swiss cheese doesn't actually line up like that. Uh, we try to get the holes not to align. Uh, the, um, the, the, there's a couple of things, the, um, the consortia, so there's a couple of vendors that are applying, uh, you know, sort of consortium logic. So if you can share some of your data, you can find out what the other guys are seeing as well, uh, both on the voice and the digital side. Um, the, uh, the mobile network operators uh, can provide some help. We're attempting to correlate the signals from both the voice and the digital side uh, to create kind of a velocity pattern that we can detect. Um, the, uh, the bad guys aren't gonna stand still, so you have to think of this as an evolving game. We're gonna have to continue to modify our techniques. Um, so it's not a once and done project. Okay, plenty of barriers to success here. Uh, internally, expectations and uh, sense of ownership are all over the place. Uh, there's a lot of difficulty conceptualizing what, what the response should be. Um, I, so I think that's, that's a difficulty. You know, it's an investment project, so it's competing with everything else. Um, and the vendor stuff, the vendors are trying, but uh, I think they're, they're, uh, they're not quite there yet for, for this use case anyway. And legal and privacy concerns are, are evolving. Um, so bottom line is you're left with a lot of choices as an, as an implementer. Um, some are impractical, like in-person registration. Probably won't work except maybe at point of sale uh, some are slow, postal pin letters, and of course, as I mentioned, they're not 100% reliable. Um, others require some kind of consent, like access to the telco data. And speaking of the telco channel, you know, spoofing, SIM swaps, uh, number porting, those are all risks that have to be addressed. 
Velocity detection looks like a pretty good thing, um, but it actually, on the project side of the equation, it's going to require more work because it's system integration. Um, especially, I think it'll be valuable with cross-channel and with the consortium data. Um, the consortiums are an interesting problem because now you're sharing data with another party, and so now you're getting into this tangle of like, well, how much can you share, and does it have to be hashed and secured and all that stuff. And, oh, by the way, the budget's not infinite. You can't just spend, spend, spend. You've got to try to find the right balance. So challenges are, well, mostly it's hard in a big company getting things into production. Um, program management has the kind of the snarl of dependencies, and uh, I think we've realized that we're just going to have to take on some work rework. Changing business practices can take a, quite a while. Um, and of course, measuring success would be a good idea, but it's, of course, it's hard to measure a negative. And yet, we're going to need a story to keep this going because this is not going to stop after one year. So that we have to have a uh, way to sort of keep this going. Um, there's, a, there's a great statue at the National Archives in Washington that says, uh, uh, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. I do think that eternal vigilance is going to be the price of keeping the financial institutions solid. Um, So I think I'm out of time, but I'd just like to suggest that you keep these things in mind for your projects, and uh, I would uh, be very happy if I had some fellow travelers on this journey, so uh, feel free to reach out to me, and that'd be great. Questions? Piece of cake, go ready to implement. <laughs> Nobody, no questions. Come on, Sarah. No. Well, it is the end of a long week. Uh, if you guys feel like me, you're pretty well, uh, pretty well had it. So I, I'll give you a pass if there's no questions. John, nothing. Okay. Well, thank you.